Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to do in this lecture is talk about political violence, common sense, the American Revolution, and a lot of pain. There's going to be a lot of pain in this lecture. We're going to follow the outline marked up above. We're going to talk about why have a government. And let's go ahead and proceed. Again, we're getting to the actual history, these tumultuous times between 1750 and 1800, where an entire generation of Americans had to actually take these, these Enlightenment ideas about you know, politics and actually turn them into a working model. And the fact that they did so in the middle of two wars, numerous rebellions and economic chaos, speaks, it speaks to the effort, dedication, and genius of the American founding fathers. And indeed, this is, it, it is the great American contribution uh, to the world, that we've created this long-term, stable, functional democracy that's worked for more than 200 years. All of this is in service to that question right up above you. I'm sure you've gotten tired of reading it. I've gotten tired of reading it, but it's all about why have a government taking Enlightenment philosophies and seeing how the Founding Fathers applied them in the six founding documents. Now, we left off with uprisings in America. Um, the Americans seeing themselves robbed of their victory in the French and Indian War. And they're seeing their rights as Englishmen being, vi being violated, that they're being taxed by royal prerogative, a violation of the English Bill of Rights that armies are being raised and kept in their homes during peacetime. Again, a violation of the English Bill of Rights. And this causes the formation of these groups called the Sons of Liberty. And it was the Sons of Liberty who began this program of active political violence against the British Crown. So let's talk about the Sons of Liberty. Those are the Sons of Liberty right up above me. And that is the flag of the Sons of Liberty it should look familiar. So who are the Sons of Liberty? The Sons of Liberty were a collection of secret political organizations formed in 1765, and they were mostly organized around opposition to the Stamp Act, which they viewed as tyrannical and illegal. Uh, now, they very, very rapidly become opposed to any action by British rule. They become opposed to any new taxes levied by the British Prime Minister. The Sons of Liberty do not hesitate to use violence. They are a violent organization. They issue threats. They tar and feather tax officials. That's what they're doing with that poor guy. They dragged him out of his home down the street to the Liberty Tree in downtown Boston, poured tar all over him, dished him with feathers, and now they are poor, filling his mouth with hot tea. They are burning down houses. They are burning down a tax office. Often these tax officials would show up from Britain, come to their house, uh, and their tax office has been burned to the ground the night before. Then they go, well, they can't work today. And then he goes home to find his own home on fire. And the Sons of Liberty standing around, waving their flag and singing songs. And if they were asked to burn their house down, uh, nobody saw anything. It must have been those Indians. And they organized these angry and rowdy protests. Dozens, if not hundreds of people in downtown Boston, in these downtown cities, gathered around Liberty Trees. I'll go into what a Liberty Tree is in just a second. Giving angry speeches. They are citing John Locke. They are citing the Baron Montesquieu. They are accusing the English crown of stealing their victory from the war, of unjustly taxing them and of dissolving the social contract between the king and his people. And just like James II was, was deposed back in the 17th century, this King George III, he's going to get deposed as well. And some of these organizations, some of these Sons of Liberty, this is how radical some of these guys are, they even oppose American slavery. They become very racially tolerant. And indeed, the most radical group, you know, the most radical group of the Sons of Liberty, the one in Boston, there's African-American members in the Sons of Liberty, singing songs, waving, waving the flag of the Sons of Liberty, giving angry speeches about freedom, about democracy, 
about John Locke and Baird de Montesquieu. And you guys, you're like reading this and you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh my God, 18th century political theory, how incredibly boring. But it wasn't, it wasn't boring in 1760s. You've got people gathered underneath liberty trees giving angry, angry speeches and using Thomas Hobbes, using John Locke, using the Baron de Montesquieu. The most radical group of these Sons of Liberty, there's Sons of Liberty in all the major cities of the colonies. The most radical group of the Sons of Liberty are in Boston, and they are headed by that fellow on the upper left. And he becomes quite famous in the lead up to the American Revolution. That is Sam Adams. And Sam Adams is a local brewer. He made, he made beer. That's what he did before he got into politics. Uh, so if you really want to feel, if you, are, if you are old enough and like to enjoy a cool beverage, lift to Samuel Adams and, you know, lift one for a true American patriot, because he was a, he's a brewer. Anyway, uh, and it's also partially bankrolled. The Sons of Liberty in Boston are partially bankrolled by a, a prestigious local banker called John Hancock, and he becomes famous because he signs his name really big on the Declaration. And there was a big oak tree in downtown Boston, and this became known as the Liberty Tree. And there's a drawing of the Liberty Tree right up above. And in the Liberty Tree, they would make little dolls, and they would make these effigies of British colonial officials and hang them. They would give these fiery speeches under the Liberty Tree. They'd all slowly sit around drinking beer and sipping whiskey, getting more and more excited. They would talk about how the British crown is violating their liberties, how they stole the war, they stole the victory in the war from them, and plan action in the future, and occasionally force British officials to recant and resign their jobs. These new tax collectors would show up from England, and then there would be a big meeting under the Liberty Tree in downtown Boston. The Sons of Liberties would show up, they'd wave flags, they'd all get progressively more inebriated as the afternoon went on. Then somebody goes, I hear that new tax collector's in town. And then 200 people get together in an angry mob, storm 20 blocks down, find this poor guy who's just showed up from England, grab him, haul him back to the Liberty Tree. And he's looking at the Liberty Tree where there's images of the prime minister that has been hung. There's images of the king, the king that have been hung. That's illegal. And he's thrown to the ground and they say, and he sees the pot of bubbling tar and they're like, Re resign your job and return to London or you're getting the full treatment. And most often to not, they just resign, resign. And then they're on the next boat back to England. Uh, and uh, that was if they're lucky. If they weren't lucky, uh, they, they wouldn't get asked to resign. They just get the bucket of tar dumped right over their heads. Uh, so Sam Adams is very radical. And in the Boston chapter of the Sons of Liberty, there are uh, African-American members. And the Sons of Liberty in Boston adamantly oppose American slavery. They are for complete liberty. Now, why they oppose American slavery is interesting, and we'll get into that in just a tick. This is why all of the really big acts of political violence that take place before the American Revolution, they all take place in Boston. The Boston Massacre, where the Sons of Liberty taunt and start throwing rocks at British soldiers and the British soldiers mistakenly open fire on, on the sold, open fire on the Sons of Liberty and kill all these people in downtown Boston. Uh, one of the times they get a meeting and they get really, really, uh, they get riled up and they decide, let's show that British governor a thing or two. And they storm off to another part of downtown Boston and they tear the governor's house down. They rip open the doors. They rip the doors off the hinges. They tear the windows out. They throw all his furniture. And he's not there because he like escaped through a back door. But they throw all his nice furniture out the windows and they burn it in the middle of the street. Yeah, just burn the governor's mansion down. And of course, the very famous Boston Tea Party, where they stormed these ships in the Boston Harbor, ripped all the tea out of the hold, threw it overboard, and uh, they all dressed up as Indians. So the next day when the British officials were outraged, they wanted to know who, 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 who vandalized these ships, who threw all this tea in the harbor. Everyone else said, I don't know. I, it's probably Indians. I don't know who did it. So here's the question. Why are the Sons of Liberty so angry? You should be able to answer this. Where do these ideas come from? 
uh, why are they so aggrieved? Why are they getting in such a state and so angry? that They're breaking into the governor's house. They're tarring and feathering people. What are they actually fighting for? And why did they welcome the revolution when it came? Oh, they were all into the revolution. When the revolution breaks out, Sons of Liberty are there. They, you know, what's, what's the old rhyme? Uh, grab your powder, grab your gun, report to General Washington. The Sons of Liberty are there. And here is one of the papers at the time. No taxation without representation. And you should have a really good idea of where that phrase comes from. Why do the Sons of Liberty think they're being taxed without representation? Where does the idea of no taxation without representation really come from? Now, I'm going to refer back to this philosophic quiz you took at the start of the lecture. Is political violence legitimate? When is political violence legitimate? When is it okay? Is it ever okay to dress up in masks and glasses and go fight police and go break into the governor's house and tear it apart and burn his, burn his furniture in the street? When is it official to grab government? When is it, when is it legitimate to grab a government official and drag him to a liberty tree and beat him half to death and tar and feather him? When does political violence become legitimate? And if the answer is yes, you should be able to say wh what's the difference between legitimate and illegitimate political violence. You should be able, and if your answer is no, you should be able to say no, but there is a point at which it does become legitimate. And what, what would make you change your mind? Because America was born in an act of political violence, multiple acts of political violence. Most of them planned and instigated by Sam Adams all the way from tarring and feathering government officials, burning the governor's house down, fighting with police in the streets. The Sons of Liberty did all of that. And the question I want to pose to you is, are their complaints legitimate? Or are they just rabble-rousing for the sake of rabble-rousing? Are they just a bunch of... Are they just a drunken mob? But not everybody is into, uh, you know, fighting with, fighting with soldiers. Not everybody's into burning down uh, the governor's house. Not everybody is into tearing ships up, burning, tearing these ships up and throwing all this tea into the harbor. There is a legal, peaceful response to this. And this comes out of a pair of lawyers who, who appear on the political scene for the first time. And these guys are... John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Both of these guys are lawyers. Uh, John Adams is the slightly more famous one, and he's the little more accomplished, slightly more accomplished lawyer. Uh, John Adams is basically Sam Adams's little-known cousin. John Adams and Sam Adams are cousins. And John Adams is from Boston. Thomas Jefferson is, of course, a planter in Virginia. And uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, but mostly John Adams write a series of letters, letters to be published in uh, colonial newspapers, as well as letters being sent to Parliament, being sent to the king. And basically, they are making the legal argument that the acts being passed by this, by especially by Grenville, but by these series of incompetent prime ministers, you can't directly tax individuals in the American colonies, not without consulting local colonial governments, because to do so is to tax by royal prerogative, which is a violation of the English Bill of Rights. There is a legitimate, peaceful, legal argument to be made here. And this is the argument that Adams and Jefferson make. Look, the taxes are illegal, okay? Stamp Act, illegal. Sugar Act, illegal. And all these other acts that come later are illegal because they're not being passed by representative authorities. And they say, look, you have two options. They say to England, Britain has two options. One, you have to be able to consult with local officials. The king approaches, say, the Virginia House of Burgesses and say, we want to pass these taxes. 
And if the Virginia House of Burgesses agrees, that is a legitimate tax. Or you give the colonies representation in Parliament. That's the legal argument. So it's not just the Sons of Liberty wrecking the place because they're wrecking the place. There is a peaceful legal option. And Adams and Jefferson, they, they don't want to fight with police. They don't want to fight with soldiers in Boston. They don't really want to separate from the mother country. But they do want their complaints listened to. And they do have a legitimate complaint. And then there is this weird back and forth. There's a back and forth between the colonies and between the British government. I'm not going to go through every single little back and forth. Uh, we've already done that in the David Shy book. But basically, you've got, you know, Parliament and the Prime Minister will pass an act. The Sons of Liberty will flip out and will burn all this stuff down. Uh, the lawyers down in Virginia will make, or Virginia and Boston, will make these very legitimate complaints the British government will back down, rescind the tax, but to show that they're still doing something, institute a new tax, which is going to create, which is going to start the cycle all over again. There's going to be more political violence, more legal arguments. The British government will back down. The prime minister will resign. And that's what happens to George Grenville. Uh, he's succeeded by Townsend up above. And then Townsend comes in and says, well, we, the new prime minister has all the same problems. The British Empire is broke, and the Americans are refusing to pay their taxes. But they refuse to listen to the legal arguments being raised by, you know, Adams and Jefferson, especially Adams. So they pass a new series of laws. The new series of laws have all the same problems. Uh, they institute more political violence, and the laws have to be rescinded, and the prime minister resigns, and a new prime minister comes in. And basically, every time the British the British withdraw an act. Every time the British withdraw a tax, it frankly empowers the more radical elements of colonial society. The more successful the Sons of Liberty are in forcing the British government to change course, the more powerful they become and the more firm their opposition is until you get to the point where the Sons of Liberty are outright agitating for separation. They're agitating for independence. They just hate the British. And this, of course, eventually you have the Boston Massacre. The Sons of Liberty get so outrageous that the British Army positions regiments in Boston and to trigger uh, the regiments, the Sons of Liberty start to protest the soldiers and they throw rocks and cobblestones. And the British, eventually it's an accident. The British open fire and that's the Boston Massacre. First man killed in the Boston Massacre, Crispus Attucks, um, African-American. African-American of Boston, member of the Sons of Liberty, good friend of John Adams. Sam Adams, good friend of Sam Adams. And it basically goes back and forth, and things get more and more and more tense. The British are not listening to the peaceful legal solution, but they are reacting to the more forceful, violent solutions. Until literally, you've got hundreds of Sons of Liberties dressed as Indians wrecking tea ships in the harbor of Boston. And no one saw anything. But out in the countryside, things are also taking place. Out in the countryside, the farmers and the people, the herders, the people that are growing wheat and barley and corn, they're not these radicals in the city of Boston. They're not these sons of liberty in New York. But they are being radicalized. They are being politically radicalized not by angry arguments under liberty trees about Baron de Montesquieu or John Locke, but they're being radicalized by their own American preachers. Because, you know, these farmers are not stupid. I mean, they've heard these arguments. They're, you know, they know, they have, and maybe not have read John Locke, but they've heard of these God-given rights. And, and who do they ask about God-given rights? Their local pastor. And they're like, well, what is it with these God-given rights? And the pastors then argue from the pulpit. Yes, we have these God-given natural rights. And then the farmers are like, the king is, the king is dissolving his social contract to, to abrogate, to, to negate our God-given rights, and the preachers are pounding on their pulpits. Yes, because all of that spirit of the First Great Awakening is still in the countryside. The spirit 
of the Great Awakening where people had personal, individual relationships with God to be saved. And the person who's getting in the way of their relationship with the Almighty is King George. The countryside starts to become radicalized as well. It's not just angry Sons of Liberty in Boston. Now, George Grenville resigns uh, 1765, and uh, they, they have to counter this political, they have to counter this legal argument that's being made by American lawyers. And they come up with this idea of virtual representation. They say, okay, and here's a cartoon of virtual representation right up above me. George Grenville uh, and these other prime ministers in England come up with the idea of, of virtual representation. And the argument of virtual representation is this, that the Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords back in Britain, Parliament, even though they're not directly elected by the American colonists, they are still considered themselves, they still consider themselves representatives of the people in the colonies. Because even though they're not directly voted for by their constituents, they are still virtually representing them. They are still looking after their best interests. So they are still rep so the, they are still representing the col the colonists, even though the colonists don't get a say in their election. Um, this is a stupid idea. This is a stupid idea dreamed up by incompetent buffoons like George Grenville. And the idea is, we know it's a stupid idea because the idea is ruthlessly mocked. They don't, we just don't mock the idea here in America. The idea is ruthlessly mocked by, back by, by British politicians in Parliament. And again, uh, the American colonists had powerful allies in Parliament. These are, these are elder statesmen who are saying, look, the American colonists have a point. If you're going to directly attack individuals, you have to consult these colonial assemblies. You have to come up with a new relationship with the colonies. Or you have to give the colonies members of parliament. And they do not, they do not want to do that. And these are, these are really elder statesmen. This William Pitt, uh, called Pitt the Elder. There's, there's uh, Pitt the Younger. And uh, the real friend of the American colonists in the British parliament uh, is this guy called John Wilkes. Uh, John Wilkes is a member of Parliament. He is very pro-American. He becomes the great American friend in the House of Commons. Uh, he's also known as the ugliest man in England. And if you ever look up his pictures, he's... Woo, woo, woo. Okay, anyway. John Wilkes argues the American cause over and over and over again in the House of Commons. And for a full generation after the Revolution, uh, John Wilkes is lionized in the United States. He's, he's like the great British friend we had he was on our side in the years leading up to the revolution. And uh, it is a cruel twist of fate that um, John Wilkes has been remembered only by his namesake. Because there's a great acting family in the United States in the 19th century, the Booths. And they decide to honor this great British friend of America by naming one of their sons after him. And that's how John Wilkes Booth uh, gets his name. Interestingly enough, one of the few members of parliament and the, the one of their very few, very talented generals is actually on the side of the Americans in parliament. He says, look, virtual representation is not a good idea. And uh, you can't actually force the Americans to do anything. He, he says that uh, fighting on the American colonies would be completely and utterly pointless. And this is actually one of the few decent generals uh, that Britain has. And, you know, he's fresh from his victories on the continent, fighting with his allies, the Germans. This is, of course, Lord Cornwallis, uh, who we will also meet again in a tick. And there's something with this, with, uh, there's something to be said for this, that all of the really bright talent, all the politically smart people, all the, all the administratively brilliant people are siding with the Americans. That, that we forget that a big chunk of British society and a big chunk of British politics, British politicians, were actually in favor of the Americans. Uh, like, it wasn't just, you know, John Wilkes or, you know, Lord Cornwallis. Uh, that all of the real talent in the British government was siding with the colonial argument. 
if not with the colonists. And increasingly, the king's government was comprised of various levels of idiots and incompetence and buffoons. These, these people were being appointed to high government officials. They were just completely, manifestly incompetent. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, king George appoints as the Lord of the Admiralty uh, this, this nobleman who is just completely incompetent. And he's in charge of the Royal Navy for the entire American Revolution. Um, he's so completely and totally incompetent that, that they actually think about bringing him up on charges of treason after the American Revolution, after the British lose the American Revolution. He's not a good admiral. He's not a good Lord Admiral. He, he's not really into, you know, the ship things and whether the ships have the right kind of copper hull or whether all the ships have things like, you know, sailors on board. Um, he's completely incompetent. He's not very good at being Lord Admiral. But what he's very, very good at is uh, drinking and playing cards. He's like... He's really good at drinking and playing cards. It's what he does most of his days. And um, one of the things he does is uh, he goes, he spends a lot of time at a place called the Hellfire Club, drinking and playing cards. And, and he likes to play these games that go on for like days. And he didn't want to stop uh, playing cards to eat. So they're playing cards, they're drinking whiskey, they're drinking Madeira wine. And they, they, they are hungry, so they should stop to eat. And, and the Lord Admiral goes, no, 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 this, is, this hand is too good. I don't want to stop playing. So he instructs his servants that instead of just merely serving a plate of roast beef and bread, I'm about to blow your mind, he tells his servants to take the roast beef and place it between two pieces of bread. That way he can hold this in one hand. He doesn't get his hands all greasy so it doesn't mark the cards. He could hold his meal in one hand and drink and play cards with the other. And that is how Lord Sandwich invented his great discovery, the sandwich. Not a good Lord Admiral. In fact, completely and utterly incompetent. Uh, but he did invent the sandwich. So here's ultimately the question. Why was King George appointing advisors, prime ministers, Lord Admirals, generals that were so utterly and completely incompetent? And the answer is simpler than you think. It's not that King George, there he is, George III. It's not that King George was stupid. It's not that he was dumb or unintelligent. In fact, for the early part of his reign, uh, King George III was actually a really good king. He was known as the pig farmer king. He was really into helping farmers and getting down into the dirt and seeing what farmers needed. He was really, really sensitive to what the English people needed. But there was a huge secret about George III. It was a massive state secret that the British royal family and the British monarchy attempted to conceal at all costs. And the Americans have no idea this is going on. But something is going on with King George. King George is slowly going insane. King George's parents were, I think they were second cousins. And his grandparents were first cousins. No, they were second cousins again. And his great-grandparents, I think, were first cousins. Cousins marrying cousins to keep the royal family small. And the result, genetic diseases. Your body not working right. Mental instability. King George III was on his way to becoming the Mad King. He was going insane. Uh, one of the theories is that he had developed a, a, a genetic liver disease, a genetic blood disease called porphyria uh, because uh, his urine turned purplish blue because his, his liver wasn't functioning property, properly and his blood was slowly poisoning itself. 
And George III would basically, he wasn't crazy all the time. He would fade in and out of madness. And as he was fading in and out of madness and going insane and talking to rose bushes and uh, he would, and in between these moments of sanity, this is when he's trying to run the government. This is why he appoints this incompetent alcoholic card player to be the Lord Admiral. This is why he appoints this person of completely mediocre intelligence, George Grenville, to try and solve one of the existential crises of the British Empire. George III is going insane, okay? That's why you shouldn't marry your cousin. Yeah, divine right of kings. They don't know this in America. In America, they just view this as tyrannical behavior from a would-be despot. All right. When is political violence legitimate? This goes back to that question. You should have a question. You should have an answer for this in your notes. And if you don't have an answer uh, in your notes by now, stop the video and put one in there because now we're going to get really violent. When is political violence legitimate? At what point is it legitimate not just to fight with police, not just to throw rocks at soldiers, not just to burn down the governor's mansion? At what point in time do you pick up a gun and shoot at government officials and kill them? Because that happens on April 19th, 1775. The uh, British soldiers in Boston hear about a colonial um, cache of weapons, gunpowder and muskets and bullets that is stored uh, in the villages uh, just outside of Lexington and Concord. And this British force marches out to seize the weapons, which the British, which the Americans as English citizens are permitted to own by the English Bill of Rights. By England's own laws, what these British soldiers are doing is absolutely illegal and is a violation of, of their natural rights. And the farmers, radicalized by their American preachers, you know, ring the bell and Paul Revere, you know, in his midnight ride, shouts, the British are coming, the British are coming. And by mid-morning, these farmers have, have gathered their muskets and powder and gathered together. And they fight in the battles of Lexington and Concord. Uh, they shoot and they start killing British soldiers. The British soldiers shoot back. The American Revolution has begun. The shot heard around the world. And after Lexington and Concord, there's no breaks. There are no breaks at this point. The American Revolution is in full swing. The American soldiers wearing blue, battling the British soldiers wearing red. And again, like we discussed when we on the lecture on the American Revolution, the Americans lose almost all the initial battles. Lexington and Concord, you know, even though the British retreat, they do succeed in seizing the weapons and ammunition. The Battle of Bunker Hill, the British take Bunker Hill. And the first really huge battle is the Battle of Long Island. George Washington loses the Battle of Long Island. The British seize New York City and will continue to occupy New York City, you know, and, and, until the end of the revolution. And things are going very bad for the Americans. Uh, there is only the small victory they have at uh, Trenton and followed by another small victory at Princeton. And this is when we get to start talking about common sense. In the early uh, days, in the early weeks of 1776, out comes a book. Uh, it was called a pamphlet at the time, but it, the pamphlet's like 68 pages long. It's a small book. What's well, what we would call a, a small book today. And it's written by this, uh, this writer up above me, Thomas Paine. And the book is Common Sense Addressed to the Inhabitants of America, 1776. Thomas Paine himself is a really interesting character. Uh, he is only a recent arrival to America, so he grew up most of his life in England, but he is a, a radical thinker. But he is not an original thinker. This is the interesting thing about Thomas Paine. Uh, what he did in the daytime, he, oh, this, is, this is actually pretty funny. Uh, his actual job was a corset maker, uh, which is to say he, he, he was a tailor who specialized in making uh, corsets for women. And I read one very funny thing where you know, don't forget that between Sam Adams and Thomas Paine, the American Revolution was launched by a brewer and a guy who made women's under underwear, which is true. At any rate, 
Thomas Paine is, is a great, I shouldn't say he's a great political thinker. He's not. He is a great political writer. Because what Thomas Paine does is Thomas Paine is able to take these arguments uh, from the Baron Montesquieu, from John Locke, from Thomas Hobbes. He's able to take these kind of complex ideas, enlightenment ideas about the role of government, and condense them into very, very simple language that he is then able to communicate, well, to the American colonists. Thomas Paine's genius is not thinking of unique ideas on his own, but being able to communicate complex political ideas to everyday people. And this is the genius of common sense, one of the founding documents of America. Common sense was written not for, you know, aristocrats sitting in their salon. It wasn't written for academics sitting around a library. It was written for people sitting in saloons. It was meant for people sitting in taverns. It was meant to be passed by the mail from one working farmhand to another. And that's how people read it. They read it in stables. They read it in taverns. They read it, you know, leaning up against a post while they're working on their farm. And it was, that's why Thomas Paine wrote it in such very, very simple English, in such very simple language, because he wanted everyone to be able to read it. And the result is, is that common sense is written in what today we would consider very modern dialect. Uh, you know, no more haths or thous or how doest thou. It's very simple. It's a very effective piece of political language. And what we're going to do is kind of pause for a moment and talk about Thomas Paine's major points, the points he makes in Common Sense. He makes a couple points. One, he talks about the nature of man. Again, you can't really understand political philosophy unless you understand what you think of your fellow people. This is what Thomas Paine says. One, man is not always evil, but evil is present in men. Society can guard against such wickedness, but only on a small scale. If you have a family farm or 20 or 30 people out in the wilderness, they don't need government to protect themselves from the evil and selfishness that's inside of them. But once you start talking about 10,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people in a nation, then people cannot guard against the evilness that is inside of them. You need government. And government functions as an extension of society to control the wickedness present in men. And in this way, Thomas Paine argues, government is itself a necessary evil. It is a bad thing, the government, but it is a thing that we need to control the selfishness of people. Two, an argument against monarchy. He says, look, kings are no better than anyone else. All people are equal at birth. The son of a king looks exactly the same at birth as the son of a slave. We are tiny, naked, screaming babies. Everyone came into the world that way. And a child of royalty is equal to any other child. Kings have no more right to rule as anyone else. And therefore, royalty, monarchs, serve no purpose in government. There shouldn't be kings. And in fact, he has this very famous quote. I'm probably going to screw it up, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to get it out. A hereditary ruler makes no more sense than a hereditary dentist. Kings are bad. Three, America owes Britain nothing. All right. Yes, Britain did help us win the war against the French and the Indians. But, Thomas Paine points out, we were fighting the French and the Indians because they were the enemies of the British, okay? Not, we had no problem with the, with the French up in Canada. They could have stayed in Canada. We'd have stayed on the colonies. We'd have gotten along just fine. The British, the, the enmity between France and Britain is what started the war to begin with, okay? The recent wars were fought because America was part of Britain, not because the French are our enemies. The French are not our enemies. And pretty much he says, look, we owe the British nothing for that victory in the war. And because of, the, because of what's happened in Boston, what's happened with the Sons of Liberty, what's happened at Lexington and Concord and Long Island, 
too much blood and rancor exist between America and Britain. And the only way to resolve the current situation, the only way to achieve peace, lies in full and total independence. And Thomas Paine's final conclusion, we must declare our independence from the United Kingdom. This is heavy stuff. This is heavy, heavy stuff. And common sense is very popular. Common sense is read by a farmhand leaning up against a post in his cornfield. It's read by uh, a dock worker, you know, sitting in a tavern at the end of a day's work. It is read, it is aimed at common people, and its goal is independence. And it is very successful. Common sense pushes Amer the American public opinion over to the side of declaring independence. And this is where we meet the Committee of Five. Under the, under the urging of Benjamin Franklin, the great figure of the Enlightenment in America, under the urging of Benjamin Franklin, a Continental Congress is formed in an attempt to negotiate with the United Kingdom, which will not hear their pleas. They send letters saying, look, if you don't resolve this peacefully, this is going to be resolved violently. Their letters to King George are ignored. Whether they're ignored because King George is, I don't know, because he's talking to a rose bush at the time, or whether he's just angry at them, we do not know. Nevertheless, with the popularity of common sense and the failure of these peaceful overtures, the Continental Congress comes to the conclusion we must declare our independence. And they assemble five members of that Congress to write, to draft the Declaration of Independence. We don't have to learn all five. You just have to learn those three right up there. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, with most of the Declaration being written by Thomas Jefferson. Again, you have virtually all the pieces of the puzzle now to answer this question. Right up above me, I'm not going to read it. I don't know, a fifth time? A sixth time? I have no idea. And we're going to get the final pieces in this puzzle in the final lecture, and I will see you there. <laughs>